Welcome to another Animal Surgical Center educational series, and today we're going to talk about perineal hernias in dogs. Perineal hernias are relatively common in dogs, much less so in cats, and it is a very debilitating condition that the pets can experience. Let's first of all look at the anatomy relevant to this type of hernia. What you're looking at is the back end of a dog, basically its rump. We have a, a series of muscles that support the rectum and the anus, and these consist of this muscle called the coccygeus, the levator ani, the anal sphincter, internal obturator muscle. Here we have the sacrotuberous ligament. The penis is located right here, and basically, this is what is called the pelvic diaphragm. That is like a dam of muscle that basically holds that rectum in place. There are other neurovascular structures that are very important, especially for the surgeon when the procedure is being performed. We have the sciatic nerve, which is better illustrated here, that runs down the back leg. It has a nerve that uh, extends to the anal sphincter, and the anal sphincter is important because it does control the feces. It helps to maintain continence of the feces so that the dog does not drop stool. We do have a large set of vessels, an artery and vein, that extend along the side of the pelvic diaphragm. It sends off a, a, a pudendal vessels that uh, then perfuse the muscles of the regional area. So why do perineal hernias occur? Generally, it's due to enlarged prostate. Almost all of these dogs that we see are intact males. And there is a theory but that the testosterone plays a role. However, likely it's due to an enlarged prostate. Subsequently, we have straining against that prostate during bowel movements. And some of these dogs actually get an inflamed prostate, which doesn't help the situation. They strain all the more. And eventually, we get weakening of the muscles that form that pelvic diaphragm with the hernia forming. So here we go. We have the pelvic diaphragm, as you can see, intact on this side. This is the side that has developed a hernia. And the classic location for the hernia is between this muscle, the levator ani, and the external anal sphincter. And so the uh, contents will pooch through this area. Here you can see we have fat. This is typically periprostatic fat. And in this case, we have the bladder that has herniated back here. We can have a variety of things that herniate back into this area. The most common is going to be the rectum. And when the rectum herniates or bulges off of the side, it somewhat kinks off the colon. It becomes impacted with stool. And as a result, the stool hardens up as it's not passed. And finally, it causes the dogs to have a lot of difficulty with constipation. The bladder, when herniated in this area along with prostate, can cause difficulty urinating. Small intestine can also herniate back here if it becomes strangulated, which in these situations, because these hernias usually have a very large opening, it does not usually strangulate the small intestine, and as a result, they may not have any clinical signs that are too significant. Some dogs may develop some vomiting as a result of that. Um, and then finally, the fat that normally surrounds the prostate, the pro periprostatic fat, certainly can herniate in this area and create quite a large bulge. Sometimes the fat also becomes strangulated as it sort of gets twisted off upon itself blood supply gets cut off and you find that they there are these uh, very hard, very firm necrotic balls of fat in the prostate or in the uh, perineal hernia. From a pet owner's perspective, this is what you may see. This is a very extreme case and, and in this there is a tremendous 
number of organs, small intestine, bladder, prostate, rectum, that's all pooched out or herniated into the hernial sac. Surgery is needed for this procedure. Conservative measures do not work. What we do in the procedure is we reconstruct the pelvic diaphragm by suturing these weakened muscles. This alone usually is not enough. This is a traditional technique that has been used, but it doesn't have a very good success rate. The best is to use the internal obturator muscle flap to perform the repair. Always essential to castrate the animals, neuter them, Taking away the hormones is going to shrink the prostate and help minimize the risk that the hernia is going to recur. In some cases in which a dog has a very extensive hernia, for example, if the bladder is herniated into this area, or we have tremendous um, um, herniation of the, uh, the rectum into the area, we will also open up the abdominal cavity, perform what's called a colopexy. That is where the colon is pulled forward towards the front of the pet, pet's abdomen. We tack it to the side of the abdominal wall, and as a result, it does not allow that to herniate into the hernial sac. The bladder can also be herniated into the hernial sac, and in order to keep the bladder in the abdomen, what's done is a ductus deferenzo pexi. The ductus is basically the equivalent of the vas deferens in a human. That is the cord that takes the sperm from the testicles to the prostate area. And this cord is no longer needed because the animal is neutered. And what is done is this cord is going to be pexied or permanently fused to the body wall. And that way it pulls the bladder and the prostate forward out of the hernial sac. And it takes the pressure off of that uh, repair that is done in the perineum. This is what is done for repair of the perineal hernia in dogs. And there's two main renditions of this. One is, of course, to take the internal obturator muscle, and here you can see the internal obturator muscle. It lays, lies on the floor of the pelvis. It has a tendon that attaches into the intertrochanteric fossa. This tendon is cut. The muscle is elevated off the floor of the pelvis and it is utilized to form the pelvic diaphragm. The tendon of this muscle can be attached to the sacrotuberous ligament and the external anal sphincter. The remaining portion of the muscle is sutured to the side of the anal sphincter and the remaining top portion of the herniation, the, the hernial opening is sutured by suturing the external anal sphincter to remaining levator ani and coccygeus muscles. Alternatively, this muscle may be sutured only to the anal sphincter and then the remaining top portion of the opening of the hernia needs to be repaired by again suturing external anal sphincter to levator ani or coccygeus or a combination of both of these. Sometimes this muscle is very, very weakened, and so we will utilize whatever tissue we possibly can find in this, in this area. Prior to closure of the abdominal incision or the perineal incision or both, uh, we will utilize a medication called Noceta. Noceta is a local anesthetic, bupivacaine, that is in liposomes, it is released slowly over a period of three days providing very nice analgesia during that period of time. In general, we find that about 90% of the patients are cured with the surgery. Um, selecting a surgeon that has experience doing this type of procedure on a regular basis provides generally a higher success rate uh, versus uh, someone who may not have as much experience. 
Complications may include infection, bleeding, sciatic nerve damage. Remember when I showed the anatomy, the sciatic nerve runs right along the area, and this is critical, especially if the, um, if the internal obturator tendon is sutured to the sacrotuberous ligament, the sciatic nerve does come in very close approximation to this area and could get damaged. That's a very uncommon complication, but can happen. Recurrence of the hernia. And we also must make sure that the pet is not going to lick at the area. Um, uh, we want to make sure that the pet does not have straining in the postoperative period. Postoperatively, you will administer pain medications and antibiotics, monitor the incision for infection, must not allow your pet to lick the incision, offer fresh water and a regular, a regular diet, add stool softeners. We always want to maintain a stool softener for the rest of the patient's life. You don't want to have super soft stools, but soft enough so that they're going to pass the stools very easily. If the patient should become soiled um, with feces, you need to clean up the area, apply A and E an ointment, and get that at the drugstore. We do allow 10 minute leash walks three times a day, and then by the third week after surgery, we gradually have you increase the exercise still on a leash. Postoperatively, we're going to have two evaluations one at two weeks. During this time, it is more or less a telemedicine recheck. We'll have you send some photos of the back end. We want to check the incision, make sure there isn't excessive swelling, and we'll want to make sure that your pet is doing well. There is a history sheet for these rechecks on this web page that you can fill out, email those back to us, and uh, then get in contact with the surgeon who performed the procedure and send them the information, send them photos, and ideally we'd also like to have a, a short video clip of your, bowel, uh, your pet having a bowel movement. At six weeks, we want you back in our hospital for a recheck evaluation. The surgeon is going to check out the uh, perineal hernia repaired, perform a rectal examination, make sure that the rectum is not deviating over to the side and forming another hernia. In preparation for coming to Animal Surgical Center, we have a couple of forms to fill out the patient-client information form, a history form on this web page regarding perineal hernias. We will also provide you an estimation of fees, assuming an uncomplicated recovery. There could be additional fees if your pet does have some extenuating circumstances or needs to stay in our hospital for a longer period of time and the typical, which is 24 hours. We'll have fasting instructions and also instructions for administration of Pepsid AC, which will help to minimize the risk of um, esophagitis, which is a bad form of heartburn in the postoperative period. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation. Please give us a phone call to set up your consultation and surgery. Thank you.